question was about an old final exam, so we're gonna go take a look at it together. I scheme for I scheme. Append is built in. The recursive call to append and the definition above is a tail call. Well, this is optional content for this semester, so let's pass over that one. Uh, implement atoms, which takes a scheme expression that returns a list of non-nil atoms contained in the expression in the order that they appear. Um, so this is kind of flattening the mm -hmm. nested list structure. Um, and there is a built-in atom procedure that figures out whether something's an atom. So I know you didn't actually ask about this one, but maybe let's just take a quick look at it. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an empty list, then you'd want to return an empty list. If you have an atom, then I think it's important that you uh, return a list containing that atom. Yes. Because that catches the atoms one uh, kind of base case. So here I would write list of exp. And otherwise, you want to append. Well, um, if you make recursive calls here, you can find all the atoms in the car. You could find all the atoms in the cutter, put them together, and then you'd have a list of atoms. Okay, so yes. uh, we might need to use that or we might not in part C. If scheme had only numbers and two argument procedures, parentheses would be unnecessary. To demonstrate, implement tally, which takes the list of atoms in a scheme expression. It returns a list whose first element is the value of the original expression. It doesn't say much about the rest. Okay, so assume that the original expression consists only of numbers and call expressions with arithmetic operators such as plus and times and exactly two operands. So uh, you can add two things together, you can multiply two things together, or you can just have a number which is self-evaluating. So let's see how we might go about this. You could figure out whether what you're looking at is a number, which point it evaluates to that number. So if car of S is a number, then you want to um, return a list with car of S as the first thing, because we haven't really figured out what the rest of the list might look like. Um, otherwise, we've reached a plus or a times, which is a symbol. And so, hmm, will that first be something? Will that second be something else? And then will cons, right, how are we gonna do this? The car of S is gonna be our plus. The car of first is gonna be the number that we're adding. The car of second is gonna be the other number we're adding. So, uh, I guess one way to go about this would be to put these three things in a list and then call eval on that. Mm -hmm. We allowed to do that? Because it doesn't, doesn't say we can't. Um, going back to the previous question, what's an atom? An atom is a general category that describes numbers and Boolean values and symbols. So it's basically like something that isn't composition of multiple different expressions. It's just a single thing. Um, so let's see if there's a, a definition. Oh yeah, so here it says, uh, atom can be nil or a number or a symbol or a Boolean value. Okay, so let's see how far we've gotten. We're gonna eval a list that contains these things. Um, I think we have to figure out how to get the first element, which seems like a call to tally on the cutter of S. Uh, we need to figure out everything else. So we need to call to tally on the cutter of first. It might be the case that this first number has to be computed. So if you look at this last example, we hit this uh -huh. multiply. First needs to give you the result of adding one and two times three or seven. I see. So and uh, then it's uh -huh. got everything else left over. So I guess the the trick that I think is the case, though it isn't stated in the question, is what is the rest of the list that's returned by tally? And I think the rest of the list should be everything in the input 
that wasn't used up when you evaluate the first sub expression. I so, see. Uh -huh. uh, we're going to evaluate this whole thing. That's S, right? Yes. Uh, I think this first tally is going to evaluate this whole thing. which gives uh, me seven. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm guessing, I'm basically just following the constraint that the car must be the value. It doesn't say what the coulder should be, but I know okay. that I need the rest of the list in order to do anything useful. Yeah, so I think what I want is for this to give me back uh, seven, which is the value of plus one times two, three, and then plus four, five the part that hasn't been processed yet. Okay. So then when I tally the coulder first, I'll get back for this example, uh, the value of this thing and then everything I haven't processed yet, but there isn't anything I haven't processed yet. So that will give me uh, just nothing. Okay, so then I, compute whatever this is mm -hmm. and I uh, cons that onto the result mm -hmm. of the coulder of second which is everything that I haven't processed yet. You're talking about the line that I'm pointing to right now. So I mean it depends what the input is but I was thinking that the input was going to be the whole last expression. So the thing with the long underline, uh -huh. that's the whole last expression. Then the coulder of that is plus followed by everything else. And the goal of tally is to evaluate the first full expression in the input. So if you tally this thing, it's actually just going to evaluate this thing and leave the rest alone. Now, I mean, I guess it doesn't say that in this question, that that's what you're supposed to do, but there's kind of no other way I see to solve this problem than to evaluate the first thing and then let a subsequent call to tally evaluate the next thing. Okay, so in the full example that we're doing here, what this would do is compute with this big expression. Yes. Uh, seven times nine is 63. Mm -hmm. And it would put that in a list because the coulder of second is nil. Yes. And mm -hmm. so it would just create this list containing 63, which is good because uh, mm -hmm. that's what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Let's go through another example, which is the recursive call that we get on plus one times two, three, plus four, five. So the thing with a bracket around it. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen there is that instead of these values, mm -hmm. we're going to get uh, one times two, three, plus four, five. as we take the coulder yeah. of s, if, if uh, this whole thing with a bracket around it is called s, yes. then the coulder is that thing. And when you evaluate, when you tally this thing, you just reach this base case and you get it back. Um, so the coulder of first is times two, three, plus four, five which means that tallying that is going to multiply the two and the three together to get six. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So the coulder of second is plus four, five, meaning the full result of what this returns is, uh, the sum of one and six, is seven plus four or five. I see. 
So that's, and that's what we wanted, right? So basically, the clitter second layer is there to return all of the contents of this expression that hasn't been evaluated yet so that it can be evaluated by something else. Let's see. I guess by the time you finish the scheme interpreter, you're supposed to know that the way in which evaluation works for compound expressions is that you evaluate the sub-expressions and then you, after you evaluate the sub-expressions, then you combine them together with uh, mm -hmm. some kind of application. So uh, that should at least get you as far as I know this is supposed to be times this is supposed to be uh, seven. Ah, uh, come on. Pretend that's a seven. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be, uh, apparently I can't just throw off my hand. This is really embarrassing. And this is supposed to be nine. And, uh, and that's how I'm supposed to get the 63. Like that's just kind of like how interpreters work. And then the rest, so given that as your guide, um, you have to figure out how to deal with the fact that when you evaluate part of this, the rest of the list is still sitting there. And that is not obvious at all. Like, uh, so, so uh, that part I agree is kind of non-intuitive. You might have to think about like, oh, how is it that I still remember the stuff that I haven't processed yet? So I guess I've lost all my annotations, which is annoying. Um, but let's see if I can try to answer your question anyway. Why did I have cutter second on the last line? The cutter second on the last line was supposed to capture the parts of the input that weren't evaluated in the second to last line. So you return them in the last line so that a recursive, so that the previous call to tally can then try to evaluate them. So like, uh, I'll do a quick annotation again. The first call would evaluate this whole thing, but the Next recursive call would evaluate this, but it would return the value of that, which is seven, one plus two times three. And it would also return all the stuff that it never evaluated so that a second call to tally could evaluate this part. So that's why you need a coder of second here. Coder of second is referring to the plus four or five. By the way, I don't think anyone actually like got this question right, so uh, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on it. Maybe a few people did, uh, but it's one of those that's on that kind of like outer fringe of of what should have been asked, and and it's asking a lot of students to figure out how to deal with uh, evaluation and. Um, and uh, keeping track of the stuff that needs to get evaluated later. So it's within scope in the course. It's great if you try to understand it. But, um, but I wouldn't obsess about questions like this. I'd always recommend to basically every student that you focus on the more straightforward ones first. OK, so the question was about how uh, property methods work and how setters work. A uh, setter can only exist for a um, method that's already a property method which is like a very weird thing. But the story is, um, if you already have a property um, called B or whatever, that does some computation and returns the result, then you're allowed to have something else happen when you assign to B. So assuming we're only this far, I can create an A, I can look up A's B, and it will run this code each time I look up A's B and compute three. But if I say A dot B equals five, it will tell me that's not allowed. What setters allow you to do is define what happens when someone writes this. Um, and let's make sure. I can get it right. I think it looks like that, where you define uh, two argument method, self and the value. Self is bound to A. The value is bound to whatever's on the right side of equals. And then it can do whatever it wants. Low value. 
It doesn't actually have to assign a B. Now the purpose is that you would uh, change some instance attribute to keep track of what's going on, but that's not a requirement. You can kind of write any code that you want. So now if I make an A, I can look up A's B, but I can also assign to A's B, but it hasn't changed A's B. All it did was print. Now this is a weird way to use it. Um, uh, like a more normal way to use this would be to have, uh, you know, uh, another thing called B. And that underscore means that it's a different instance attribute. And uh, maybe when you look up B, you always get the float version of self.b, just to like make sure that it's always a float, even if you assign it an int. And uh, what does it mean to assign to b? Well, maybe uh, it asserts that the value is greater than zero, and then it assigns it to b. OK, so how would this code work? I can make an a. I can check what a.b is. It will tell me 10.0. If I assign a.b is 5, and then I look up a.b, it will tell me 5.0 instead of 5, because it always returns the float version of whatever a's underscore b's value actually is. Now, this thing really does exist. It's just that um, this underscore tends to signal to people like, don't use this one. Always use the, this one. And then it will make sure it gives you a float value. And if I say a.b equals negative 5, then it'll give me that assertion error. That's typically how this is used. Yeah, there are many cases in which you can write a function that describes how some other piece of syntax in Python works. So you can write a function that says how this works, and you can write a function that says how this works, and you can write a function that says how this works. So uh, what you put in that function is basically entirely up to you. Uh, it's just Python giving you a way to define what happens when you're building your own class and it's supposed to behave in some like uh, non-standard way, but still interact with the rest of the Python language. And um, property methods are part of this uh, required material for this course and uh, that includes setters, so you might as well learn how these work. Um, they were in some lecture once upon a time. Let's see if I can remember which one. The composition lecture has property methods. Okay, so it was in there somewhere. Um, and yeah, the next question was, can you ever just call this directly instead of having it be called for you? I don't believe so. I think that maybe there's some way to access it, but I think the only way that this would ever get called is by using an attribute assignment statement. Yeah, but in order for this to work, this name, this name, and this name, I think all need to be the same. I'm not so sure about this one, but at least these two have to be the same. And you always make all three of them the same. If you want different properties for like different names, you could do that down here. You could have a separate property for an attribute called hello or something like that. Um, and whatever this returns would be what you get when you write a.hello. But then this one wouldn't be related to these two in any way. 